So welcome everybody. Uh, with us today is Lehman Pascal. Thanks for being here, man. Really enjoying your new book. Um, good year for uh, a time between worlds. It's just coming out, no? Absolutely. Yeah, I just uh, got my first solid copy of it at the Metamar and Spirituality Retreat last week. So now oh, nice. I've got that's, one in my hand. That's always cool. Uh, Lehman, I've read the first three pages. <laughs> Uh, and I thought, fuck, man, this guy can write. He dances with words. It's amazing. I really like. I'm complimenting you on the book before I've even read it because, because, because uh, I just love the introduction. The first, I love the first three pages, but I also just love the way you write. It's like, wow, you're a dancer. You're like Gurdjieff called himself uh, the dance teacher, uh, and I, I think you're a dancer with words. Well, I appreciate that because it all goes downhill after the first three pages. So you <laughs> like the best possible part. <laughs> but no, I think the um, uh, what I wanted to bring to it, and one of the things you don't often get in books about Gurdjieff and the work is a sense of fun, a sense of play, a sense of that humor and dance that Gurdjieff brought to so much of his own stuff. And overall, a sense of kind of contemporaneousness and refreshment that I think the lineage needs. Right. I mean, yeah. Andrew is our Gurdjieff expert. I think you're 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 neck deep into Gurdjieff's work for like what a half a year now. Yeah, we just did a course with with Luca Beckning called The Hard Way. It was three months. Uh, yeah, it, it was uh, it was great. Um, uh, Luke Luke is Luke Luke is 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 a deep Gurdjieffian, I would say. Um, and he 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 has a totally different style than you. He's very. Um, Let's say he's he's very he has gravity with each word. It's like it's right. Serious Gert Jeff 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 it was a wonderful course. Um, not not without humor, not without levity. Um, but 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 again, I think it's a very different kind of style. I guess we all have different styles. Because um, Gert people, well, I think, I think the Spensky school of Gert Jeff. Just, just one more thing. The Spensky yeah. uh, school of Gurdjieffian sort of focused on this idea of conscious suffering and, and sort of took a lot of Gurdjieffian ideas and made them very, you know, um, made them like, like a dogma. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's, there's two really important points there. I think one is that whatever this work is, it's designed to produce different results in different people, mm -hmm. right? It's meant to be an engine for your unique unfolding growth. The fourth way is a, a path in life. It's a way of transforming everything you have into what you could be. So the results aren't supposed to look identical. But I think, yes, there's been a tendency with the... Um, lineages that descend from Uspensky and from Uspensky's framing, which sort of, I don't want to say contaminates because it's very useful. He's brilliant. I've gotten a lot out of Uspensky, but there's been a tendency to have his conception of the work kind of solidify in a dry and serious way that's, I think, gone too far in making people who think they're members of a formal lineage opposed to people who they think of as like weird outliers who aren't getting it correct. So yeah, there's been a consolidation, there's been a dogma, um, but that can be good too. It can be the situation that's needed to create the dynamic interplay or the dialectic between those people and the people who are treating it more freely to generate some, a hybrid, a rebirth, a renaissance of Gurdjieff's understandings. Yeah, I was thinking about this because, I mean, if you compare his life work and his methodology with those of, let's say, Aurobindo or Crowley, it's like both have way more, you know, certain techniques and practices uh, in their in their suitcase, let's say. You know, you and you have the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn on one side and the Integral Yoga on the other side, and that's kind of missing. And I think you mentioned that later in your book that that you really can't really pinpoint, you know, specific practices that create a canon of some sorts for Gurdjieff. It's way more freely, you know, as you say, more more suited to individual developments, no? To some degree. I mean, there are some general sort of practices and there are things that he mentioned as practices to particular people or that ain't his or in his books. And some people have gone and done some good effort in compiling books of Gurdjieff's practices. But 
His practices are always tuned to someone in particular. They're always an example, an expression of principles of practice. And I think his concern is more for people to assimilate the principles and to learn to be able to generate the practices that are appropriate to their own character and their own circumstance. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. I, I was reading a book uh, recently um, about uh, dialogues. Have you read the book about di his some of his dialogues in Paris? You know, in the during the war. During the during the war, yeah. There's a there's a, and 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 you can really feel how directly he's working with people. You know, um, on an individual level, and and I, I saw that. I saw he's giving out these practices to individuals, and these could become generalized and uh, become like something we should do, but we should you shouldn't do them. <laughs> you know, unless they really suit your, you know, uh, psychophysical being in that particular context, in that particular moment. Um, on the other hand, there are the dances and there are the circulations and there is the self-remembrance. And there is, I, I don't, I think there is quite a canon of Gurdjieff practices. Um, it's just how to apply them is, is, is the question. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that Gurdjieff groups have traditionally thought of themselves as doing, as providing a container for understanding the principles of practice and trying to apply them to people in a way that makes sense. Because there could be a problem with people just thinking these are practical exercises you can read in a book and duplicate in your own condition. Generally speaking, I don't think that's too problematic. You should be experimenting. But a lot of them are very finely attuned to particular circumstances, like you say, during the war talks. And one interesting thing in the war talks, it's not a comprehensive, but what I see in the war talks very often is he's offering a practice from a different center than the questioner is asking from. Right? If you ask a very philosophical question about your practice, he tells you to think about how much you owe your mother. If you ask a very emotional question, he'll tell you to go and like lift some wood or something like that. So there's a constant counterbalancing of what he sees as the situation of your organism. But that said, there are a bunch of general practices, right? The dances, mm -hmm. the music, the reading of the books is a practice. Yeah. Um, at one point in In Search of the Miraculous, he mentions a few practices that he thinks would be good for everybody. And the main one, he says, is um, struggle in the attempt to not express unpleasant emotions immediately. He's like, that's something everybody could do, and it will just bring them a little bit more depth and a little bit more self-awareness, that kind of thing. So there are some general practices, but at the same time, that's not where the work is trying to go. It's trying to get you to assimilate the principles that are generative of practice that is actually adaptive to your needs and circumstance. And very often that, at least initially, requires some feedback from a peer group or a supervisor, but not always. I mean, it's a little bit, uh, it, it has a little time passed since I've last read Gordiev. Um, but as far as I remember, and I might be wrong here, but... Um, Anyhow, so my, my idea was that his history and his lineage was always a little bit opaque. No, and I think that's what I was getting at, that you could, like, at least with Crowley and Aurobindo, you could you could pinpoint to a kind of lineage and deduct from then, you know, their development of certain techniques and practices. Whereas, you know, um, I, I might I remember, you know, the, the meetings with Remarkable Man. So he has, like, this whole allegory of, of travel and being exposed to different cultures and different people. But in, in what way, in which way that reflected on his own uh, learnings and his own way that was always a little bit op opaque. No, so so um, or, or or can you pinpoint his lineage in a kind of way? That's the question here. Yeah. There are elements of his lineage that you can pinpoint very clearly, right? Uh, he obviously it owes a lot to Sufi traditions, and many people have tried to follow up those investigations. Um, he spent time in Egypt. He spent time in Tibet with lamas. So there's that kind of thing. But he also went out of his way to make it opaque, right? He famously right. burns his own identification and history when he enters Russia to be and become a teacher in the West. So there's a sense in which he doesn't want you to focus on that. And he wants you to focus more on the ability of people to collectively generate work schools 
when those things are needed rather than fit into particular lineages. Like when we say the fourth way, one of the things the fourth means as opposed to those other systems of mental, emotional, or physical training is a system that bubbles up in the world in response to the needs of the world where people are able to regenerate something ancient in their contemporary circumstance. And for me, and in this book, that sense of the ancient is very strong. Obviously, I'm focused a lot on the return of the shamanic, but I think he was too. And I think what he was doing was really searching out the fragments of a prehistoric wisdom teaching that he could find in the remnants of the esoteric schools of the different civilizations that he could gain access to. Yeah. But we shouldn't put aside the point that he was something like a secret agent for a while, working for the Russian government, but also taking different identities and different names. And the play of being a clandestine, ambiguous figure is very prominent in his own character. Right. Yeah, it's interesting in our group, we had some Sufi people. You know, I'm a Vajrayanist. Um, uh, you know, Luke, Luke is a Christian. Um, and uh, in in some ways, when I look at Gurdjieff's work, I can I can say, okay, this comes from Tibet. This comes from you know, the Vajrana, you know. And and then the Sufi people say, oh no no, this comes from uh, the Sufi tradition. And Luke, of course, is 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 claiming that he's and he has said a few times that this is esoteric Christianity. He's described his teaching as esoteric Christianity. So uh, so uh, and we had this kind of argument about it. It's like, is he a Christian? Is he this? Is he that? Um, but uh, but uh, but uh, it's 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 a strange it's a strange kind of thing. He seems to be a, a meta teacher of all teachers, or some meta. He seems to ha he seems to have a meta tradition, um, which which informs all all the traditions. That's that's my sense. I don't know what you think, uh, Layman, about that. Yeah, I've got a section in the book called uh, something like preschool for religions, and that's what I see him as doing. Like, what are the underlying dynamics that become the different schools of Dharma? Mm. Right. So, yes, he calls it esoteric Christianity at one point. He grew up in a Christian zone, uh, but he means a Christianity that's much older than what we yeah. think of as Christianity. And he means the esoteric lineages of all religions. And he's very... I mean, he respects whatever religion you grew up in because that's part of your access to your own depths, but he's also scathing in his mockery and insults and attacks on every organized religion. But there's something in what he's doing that I think of as almost Taoist, like it's the underlying capacity to be in any kind of a path, right? Uh, there's a point, and I think maybe it's in views from the real world, where somebody asks about Christianity, and he says, well, it's not like you can just do it, right? You have to be able to be one. You don't just get to decide you're going to be a Christian. Can you do any of the things Christ said? Can you do any of the things Buddha said? So it's not about choosing the appropriate culturally based way. It's yeah. about um, do you have the basic set of capacities, understanding, and inner muscles to be able to undertake any way at all, e even a secular way, right? So it's not, yeah, it's not about selecting. It's not about finding the right one. It's about are you capable of doing any of them? So I think of it as a preschool in that sense. What are the basic skills you would need to undertake a way? But this was also due to this. Probably very very relevant in the contemporary world where we've got this like cacophony of ways and yeah. we're like choosing from it in the spiritual supermarket sense but if you can't do any of them then what good are all of them to you i mean he is at least partly responsible for the way you know of how we dealing with spirituality now you know the spiritual boulevard you know you can choose from everything you want he and and a couple of figures from you know that turn of the century they instigated you know this whole global kind of approach to spirituality and religion as far as i understand with blavatsky and all these people that traveled extensively to understand different approaches and to find you know common denominators between all these different different systems and he was pretty instrumental for this, at least as far as I understand. I think he saw the the unfolding of the modern predicament very clearly, right? That his he had a very strong kind of early postmodern critique that allowed him to see the solutions to some of the problems that were just beginning. So I think the kind of cacophony and marketplace and transcultural situating of religion and existential development today is something that would have been obvious to an insightful, deep, sensitive person in 1890. It's clearly the world that was coming and the world that we had to prepare the dharmas to be ready to regenerate themselves from within.
Andrew, may, may I may I jump into this because now you you mentioned modern, you mentioned postmodern, and in your book you allude to metamodernism and the time between worlds. So can you elaborate a little bit on this? So where do you situate him? And and I mean the second part of the question would be, you know, how what what would Goodyear do today? Mm -hmm. I. Obviously, as the subtitle of the book indicates, I'm situating him as a precursor of metamodern spirituality, and that's partly because I want to put his insights and his being and his practices into conversation with the emerging metamodern integral and liminal communities. But I think it's not an unjustified argument to suggest that he would have been called something like integral or metamodern if he was communicating today, because there's... Um, a deep embrace of tradition, a deep understanding of modernity, and deep understanding of the postmodern critiques, right? He's multicultural, he's multilinguistic, he has a very interesting set of critiques about how modern systems are functioning, but also how we are failing from our critical view of modern systems to be able to correct them. And so there's a deep understanding of the of the modern layer, the modern civilization, its plural extensions and its self-critique, and the need to create a coherence that brings those alternatives back together. Like some, I was just thinking about this morning, that modernity is sort of, it's like a linear systematic approach that orients to a single variable. And then there's this layer of incoherent alterity where you keep finding alternatives. And that proliferates until there's a stable alterity, which looks a little bit like right brain, left brain, or yin, yang, any kind of thing like that. But he's definitely bringing the field of possibilities and critiques of the modern back together in a new organizational system that is depth-based and has a typology. And when you read his descriptions, and especially when you read the elaborations in some of his students, like J.G. Bennett's work, it's obviously resonant with some of the stuff Ken Wilbur and the other uh, late 20th century big picture model makers were trying to do in their elaboration of what we need to go beyond the postmodern. It's interesting when you said that I was thinking if he'd been around he would have been so savage to all the modern the metamodernists and the postmodernists he would have savaged everybody because that's what he did but but maybe that that was what you're saying on some level although it's you know it's almost like his I would say his critique was more than a critique it was like he really wanted to to it says in the first page of the Beelzebub book something about you know, totally um, undermining all of the basic axioms of what people think in, in the modern world. So associating Absolutely. him with modernism and postmodernism, it's, well, yes, but maybe more radical than that. <laughs> yes, but maybe, I think, is a perfect way to try to approach this. Because when we say metamodern, we're describing like, he has at least that ability of cognitive mapping that's implicit in everything he's doing. But clearly he wouldn't be walking around as a card-carrying metamodernist, although, to be fair, most metamodernists aren't doing that either. But he would be, uh, I think you're right, savagely critiquing any structures that emerge, insulting everyone, demanding that it go much, much deeper. And in fact, this is a big part of his critique about communication in general, is that if you're saying something that sounds nice and is comprehensible, then it's not really communicating existentially transformative information. So insofar as you look at an integral map and go, yeah, that checks out, then it's not really changing you. Just like if you read um, the works of a great Buddhist sage, or you read the Bible, or you read Blavatsky's work, and you go, oh, yeah, that makes sense, and it sounds good, I should do that. From Goethe's point of view, the system is now failing, right? You're not getting the communication. It's going to the wrong part of you. And so he was very elaborate in his behavior and his communication style to try to break that and get around the fact that we normally receive even transformational information to the part of us that can't transform. So yeah, but I'm sorry. I'm so, there's one one part just at the beginning of the book uh, where you mentioned, you know, about who, um, which Gurdjieff are we talking? You know, and you say, of course, we're talking about you, your Gurdjieff, which is like a kind of, you know, um, composition of certain archetypes. And I found that very nice. And I, you know, in this conversations, like for me, you know, there's this trickster archetype. There's also like kind of a, a Jupiter archetype that that cuts through, you know, bullshit. 
basically. And so you have, and, and th this was what I was getting at. So we're living in this time and, and you purposefully call it, you know, the time between worlds, good year for time between worlds. And this is like a completely political time, you know, where you have like a multitude of crises that are not necessarily spiritual, you know, so you have, you know, uh, different wars brewing and going on and you have financial problems and climate. And so these are not necessarily spiritual problems. And so my question is like how, in your mind, what um, would Gurdjieff be a more political figure now? No, no, I don't no. think he would. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, partly because, like what we were just saying, that the realm of political discourse and political identification is one of those sort of obvious things that consumes our energy, and we think we understand, and which, from his point of view, would be inhibiting transformational activity. Now, there's you could argue a politically generative side effect to his work right that you can't have real regenerative change unless people change and that means training like an esoteric subset and making that information available to a mesoteric set of intermediaries who can bring esoteric knowledge and transformed individuals into contact with public institutions and that most people will be in that general exoteric set of public institutions and public functions. And you have to have a good circulation between these three categories, just like anciently you have to have good complementary circulation between shamans and villagers. So there is a political generative side effect down the road from this work, but that's not his specific area of concern and training. He wants the people who are capable of it to be more radically transformed. And if you don't have that part, the political solutions aren't really going to get established anyway. It wouldn't be uncommon, though. No, I mean... I mean, I'm, I'm just reminded, and I had this conversation with Andrew already, but, you know, it was a video by from John Verveke where I talked about the differences that he has with, with Peterson and that Verveke, I'm breaking it like down to, to the, you know, to, to the bare minimum. But he said that he likes to change people by changing narratives and that uh, Peterson likes to be political and be in that kind of forum to, to, to change the 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 circumstances and the environments and so i was wondering which is the better way and so you obviously have you know spiritual figures that became also political figures arubindo was at least sometime a very political figure tim Thilleri was a political figure so I, I, i'm just wondering like it wouldn't be uncommon for a spiritual figure to have a phase in their life where they're like okay now i'm entering the public and the political sphere and try to to change something there I mean, there are opportunities. It's not like what we're saying is you can't be spiritual and political at the same time or in alternation, as many people do. But that wasn't Gurdjieff's focus. That I think he right. conceived of his work as upstream from all of that. Just like he said, you can produce different styles, a more playful or a more serious version of it. You could produce Christian Gurdjieffians or Islamic Gurdjieffians or atheist Gurdjieffians. You could produce political or non-political Gurdjieffians. But his point was to produce more of integrated human beings who had the force and insight and imagination to be able to manifest something in the world right yeah i agree with that um i i think of gurdjieff kind of i don't know if you agree as more like a you know a, re a extremely revolutionary figure like the buddha or something right he's just he he comes to the moment uh where where nothing is is you know he's right at the war time where nothing can be believed in anymore and offers an, an entirely new, different, you know, perspective, and he goes right to the root of the problem, rather than dealing with, you know, uh, you know, politics. I would say that, you know, even Aurobindo was a bit similar. He was very political in the beginning, and then he sort of became, then he went into the yogas to try to get to the, the root or the source of, of everything. Uh, that's how I see it. Um, uh, yeah, I think there are lots of opportunities for people to bring spirituality and transformation into politics, but that's not what Gurdjieff was doing particularly. He does come at this interesting moment that's also the moment of Dada and surrealism and this artistic rebirth in Europe. And I see him very much as part of the European avant-garde, at least for a while, thinking that culture is in some ways upstream of those political concerns. 
Uh, Trungpa, who drew a lot from Gurdjieff, including terms like idiot compassion, said that if you want to change the world, you have to change the culture. If you want to change the culture, you have to change the art. And if you want to change the art, you have to make it into Dharma art that's applicable to the time period. So I think Gurdjieff has a lot of that sensibility in himself. He thinks of changing the ethos in which the politics is occurring. Because the politics from the previous ethos failed so catastrophically, and with the new a massively destructive machinery that we have at our disposal now, the further future failures of our system could be even more cataclysmic. So you really, there's an urgency to change things, but that change has to be, I think, upstream of the kinds of political options most people take seriously. But that said, Gurdjieffians can and should be engaged as it comes out of their being in whatever kind of political action yeah. they see fit. If they had a political nature, so to speak, then that would be what they should do, right? I, I, that's how I sort sort of see it. I, I don't think we can force a, a political nature on somebody, <laughs> you know, or force politics as as an occupation or as, you know. I always, but because well, maybe that's just because personally, I I don't I don't go in that realm. I, I'm afraid I mean, of Gandhi that, was political as an imposition. What? Well, Gandhi mean, was Gandhi super, was po extremely political. Yeah, Gandhi was political to a fault. Um, maybe we can talk more about your book, Layman, um, sure. and go, go more into your book. <laughs> I, no, I, I really like to hear about, like, what is your particular, let's say, maybe, maybe, maybe relationship history and 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 unique take on, on Gurdjieff. Uh, well, the book is trying to do a couple of things at once. Like I said, it's trying to bring Gurdjieffian practice into conversation with leading edge cultural and intellectual efforts. It's trying to offer a, a style that could be useful in the regeneration and deeper appreciation of Gurdjieff's work. And it's trying to get across a lot of my own insights and practices disguised as uh, a reading of Gurdjieff. My history with him goes way back. I probably first heard about him in, in the Wilsons, in Colin Wilson and Robert Anton Wilson's books when I was a kid. Uh, so I had a vague sense of him, but it wasn't until I discovered Uspensky, really dove into Uspensky in my teens, because Uspensky was bringing together like math and physics and occultism and Nietzsche. It was irresistible. But then you start to see that Uspensky has limits in the way he's understanding it. You start to see that there are other people who also were drawing from Gurdjieff besides him, and they have different opinions of it than he did. And then you move into the person himself. So I've spent uh, decades rereading and struggling with the texts, as well as hanging out with different kinds of Gurdjieffian groups. And over the time, I've become especially fond of people who've left Gurdjieff groups or who were trying to generate them on their own or different kinds of spiritual communities that weave some Gurdjieffianism into them. Lee Lozowick and E.J. Gold and Jan right. Cox were some interesting late 20th century people who had a strong connection with the work but weren't officially involved in it. So I have this sense of like a very broad, very rich community of Gurdjieffians who've gone different ways with it. And it may be time to um, create a spirit of reconciliation so they can bring their insights and their energies and their flavors back together. And a lot of the book, though, is just my personal appreciation, the sense of paying him back and of appreciating him because... I've found his humor and his heart and his peculiar take and his rich complexity uh, just tremendously nourishing and transformative over the years, always generative of new practical insights for me. And I started off um, with a wide range of teacher mentors, right? some from the past, some legendary, some embodied and as I worked through all of them, I winnowed it down to a small handful that were really important to me. But after a while, it seemed like I was treating them all from a Gurdjieffian perspective. That Gurdjieff was giving me the tools and the confidence and the energy to understand how I was approaching all of my other teachers, mentors, and sources. So it's been really a journey of discovering that I'm caught <laughs> in the Gurdjieff stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very fond of Lee Lozowick and E.J. Gold as well, and they strike me as the people who are out often more Gurdjieffian than the Gurdjieffians. 
Uh, it often strikes me that the people outside the Gurdjieff work are more Gurdjieffian than Gurdjieff, Gurdjieffians. And almost by design, it, it would seem that Gurdjieff was very fond of kicking out his own people, uh, you know, and um, and uh, even his 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 major disciple, I forget his name, uh, he got everybody to sort of write a, write a little text saying that don't stay away from this guy, he's corrupt. And, and then this guy ended up, do you, who, do you know who I'm talking about signing a thing saying, you know, I was... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a famous in, story where, and, and yeah. it's a, it's historicity is a little bit dubious because Gurdjieff modifies this a bit as an inclusion in Life is Real Only Then When I Am. Right. But he goes to the Americans as he tells a series of instructional stories as parables of his encounter with the American group that was led by A.R. Oraj. And he, when he gets there, he f finds that these people who think they're being good Gurdjieffians all have in his mind on their forehead a candidate for the madhouse, right? Their neurosis is being mm. exaggerated, not solved. And so he's trying to figure out what he can do to help them. And he ends up asking them to disband their group and sign this document saying they will have nothing more whatsoever to do with Alfred Orage. And when Orage hears about this, he recognizes what the move is. And he rushes there immediately and he signs the paper with no hesitation that he will have nothing more to do with himself or his own teachings and rejoins the group at the zero level again. Yeah, and that's and the beginning of a story of Araj's transformation because Araj is not really highly regarded in the work at the beginning. But by the end, he's considered to be one of the primary disciples. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add that the part that struck me is that when he when Araj signed the... Uh, this paper, uh, Gurdjieff started to weep because this is what he wanted from his students. He, he didn't want uh, them to be syncophantic, you know, uh, you know, uh, guru worshippers who couldn't think for themselves and, and that kind of thing. He, he, w he really wanted a, a ra radical engagement and transformation, you know, no matter what. Though, so he was um, very good on that front for like if you look at somebody like Adida or Osho they kind of open up to any of the hippie yeah. spiritual drifters uh, of their time period but Gurdjieff was very selective in taking people who were already highly accomplished had a strong sense of self and a strong ability to do things he was getting good musicians good physicists good writers leading avant-garde artists things like that so he exactly, expected yeah. a lot from them and he was willing to put them under stress and to drive them away when he felt like they were too dependent upon him and more in need of uh, getting deeper into their own ability to regenerate the work and become independent centers of its promulgation. Mm -hmm. so that said, I want to speak in behavior like the the lineal groups the gurja foundations they serve a really important function there's really impressive people there they're oh, yeah. archiving the material and they form like one end of an electrical circuit but the other end of the electrical circuit is equally important the the gurjefians and the more than gurjefian non gurjefians uh they are teamed together somehow you need both mm. of those to generate the creative ferment that will carry this work forward yeah, it's good that you say that. Yeah, for for respect of of the, those communities and um, yeah, yeah. No, I'm wondering. You know, like for me uh, personally, um, Gurdjieff became compelling to me, and I didn't even know why. And why I think he's so interesting is that th there's an endlessly there's and there's something endless to uncover all the time you know you, you can never become exhausted with with his work because there's always something more to to find s somewhere which is this is the this is what makes him like i think a great philosopher although philosophy people would never want to include him in in their canon of of, of philosophers but but in the, in the sense of a generative thinker not not just on the intellectual level but on all levels I don't think I, he's like top five of the of the century, as far as I'm concerned. You know. Yeah. yeah, but why is that? That's so interesting what you say, Andrew. Because I mean, 
and 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 I find this this very hard to to articulate. But but I mean, there is some opaqueness and some occult quality to it, which is always okay. The symbol is not completely there, but it's always something that we can aspire to. It's always something that we can something learn from. You know, it's like independently where you are. If you're like 18 and you read it, and it's it's mm. mind boggling, and you orient yourself, but then you're like approaching 50, and it's like oh, it's still great. There's still something new there, and so. I, you know, I, I always struggle, you know, with the historical si significance of people like this, because you mentioned, you know, the, the revolutionary archetype that appeared, you know, turn of the century, 18, 19, 19 20th century. And so, like, why is it? Why do these people um, appear, did appear at that time? Um, why didn't they appear later? Because like, if you use like, like a spur dynamics, one, you know, first tier, second tier frame, the leap to the momentous leap to a second tier is way more important. Why did these eternal revolutionary archetypes appear 150 years before? Why, you know, because like psychology wasn't really framed, it wasn't really developed yet. And so, but they kind of they kind of gave the 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 cultural life and the the scientific life and you know artistic life they gave it a complete push, you know, in every in every possible direction. And that's so, prophecy, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah, what and it's super, prophecy is, right? Yeah, and it's super yeah. weird to to explain. And I, I think that was what I was asking. So it's super hard to me to explain. Yeah, that was a figure, you know, at the beginning of postmodernity, postmodernity, or this is a meta modern kind of figure. It's, it kind of transcends time, and and I don't know how that works. It's super interesting that there was like this cluster of revolutionary spiritual teachers. Mm -hmm that appeared at the same time in different areas of the globe uh, and and we're still and and we're still looking up to them and still downloading new informations depending on where you are and i and i guess in in, in terms of people like like Gurdjieff or Aubinu that will still be the case when i'm 70 independently of where i am and that makes you know the whole situationness of of where he was and what it means to us it ma makes it super difficult don't you agree don't you find it weird also it's very interesting in a lot of ways i mean one aspect of it is the communication style that it's rich enough and complex enough and comes from a deep enough part of him that there's always something there in it you don't get used to it it doesn't get exhausted part of it is this prophetic instinct about the future very often you see a lot more of the future when it's beginning than when you're in it right you could say this about hegel as well that hegel's ability to see the deep and consequences on the other side of modernity is partly because he's so well positioned at the beginning of modernity to see what it's going to be and once you're in it you're identified with it and you can't track it as well because it's all around you so this this initial wave, like early 20th century and late 19th century wave of prophetic figures, they come from a deep, a deep training in the inherited lineages, and they enter into a very salient confrontation with the new kind of civilization that's emerging, and they have to occupy that in-between space. But I think also they had a lot of opportunities that we don't necessarily have as much anymore to have personal experience of the archaic and the sacred realm. Right, that they could just go to the temples and talk their way into it or sit in all of the holy places. The world was not crowded. It was not as overwhelmed with media and communication and consensus narrative making. They were uh, wild and deeply personal in their experience of a lot of these things. And I think today we're a little bit dampened down in our ability to truly become what's capable of a spiritualized human animal. Although there may be a new wave of this coming as a new mm. kind of culture rises and the, the wise have to crash into it and negotiate a new way for wisdom to show up under the new forms. It's very interesting. I was speaking with a teacher in the um, in the lineage of Lee Lozovic, and he was saying, the time of the great teachers is over. Most of the teachers are kind of, you know, not that impressive. They're, they're hidden, you know. He said he was describing himself. He's like, I'm not that impressive. He's a very accomplished teacher. He said, the, the great teachers will come maybe later, but this is a time 
where those kind of teachers don't 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 appear. Uh, and and I, I think it's because again, it's because of the the, the network state, the fact that everybody is conforming to some kind of model and and though this wild crazy wisdom character um can can exist in in the particular ecosystem or environment at least at least in in the public in any way like you can't imagine somebody like Gurdjieff being in in public you know or on the internet you can't imagine he he would have to be hidden away somewhere in and you know in the most hidden possible place i would say whereas so, so he yeah, would either be secluded or, or he would have to create some kind of adaptive public persona. Like I, in the book, I call him a mixture of uh, Indiana Jones, the Buddha and Borat. Right. Yeah. So because Borat is this comical pastiche Eastern European figure that collides with Western civilization. And in that collision undermines the, the social and conscious habits of the people he's interacting with. That's so good. you could mm-hmm. see a Gurdjieff figure exist, perhaps concealed by a comical public persona or something like that. Yeah. But I think there has been a shift from what I call the age of the tantric patriarchs, most of the 20th century and this new period that we're in, which is much more intersubjective. It's much more therapeutic. I think it will be a temporary interval, but there's something to learn here, which is how have we been off guard? How have we been insensitive? What are the things we've left out of this? There's a lot to pick up as a mutual system. But once we've done that, it may be time for uh, some great teachers to come again. Tantric patriarchs, open. that's great. That's a great term for that. Mm-hmm. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I wonder if there'll be some great women teachers that arise as well. I mean, you know, there, 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 there are great women tantric teachers in the Indian tradition, Again, they tended to be more hidden, um, and they tended to be le- less public, uh, just by the nature of things. But uh, and you always have to read through everybody's idiosyncratic style, right? Yeah. Like Gurdjieff put a lot of trust into Jean de Salzman as his primary mm-hmm. formal successor, right? And when you see there's some little bits of video of her, and it looks like a sweet little old lady. <laughs> <laughs> but the people who encountered her said that she was terrifying in her amount of insight and beingness. But you wouldn't necessarily get that from the from the book cover, so to speak. Yeah, that's the sly way, right? That he talked about is that you have to be hidden, and you know you can't just advertise this stuff. I mean, not to become like too uh, too esoteric, but I mean, like we are bound by our very limited uh, uh, time frame of our own lives. You know, and we can maybe think 150 years, but, you know, you mentioned in your book eons, you know, and, and, and so this was also the time when these patriarchs appeared when one eon was over and that needed a push to a certain direction. And mm-hmm. maybe our, our differentiation between modernism and postmodernism and metamodernism is not so, uh, doesn't look like that from a greater perspective. As you would like, you know, maybe you would say in 500 years that postmodernity is like an outlier, like a like a tail end of modernity itself. You could perfectly make that case. It does seem to us as two distinct phases now. But I, I would agree can, with that completely. Right? It it only looks like these phases because we're right in it. Right. right. If you zoom back out, uh, we're going to see a deep continuity. What modernity is doing through post-modernity and meta-modernity and whatever the next kind of thing is, that's right. all going to look like one move from a bigger historical perspective. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so I, I like this esoteric notion of eons, you know, and so you have you have like deep, deep seated cultural and psychological paradigms that need need a, la- a large time spent to play themselves out and to and, and, and then it gets replaced by another one, you know, and and for me, this this, you know, 80, 90, 20 cent turn to the 20th century was always, you know, kind of kind of a shift to a new new paradigm. And that's always why I kind of kind of a little bit skeptical when when there are like movements uh towards towards older paradigms let's say you know Mm -hmm. Mm. anyway what do you mean by older paradigms no well i mean you know it's like i i find you know the the um there's a book uh by slaughterdyke um it appear uh, when when did it come out 15 years ago, you should change your life or you must change your life. And in its forward, 
he is saying, well, there's a ghost going through Euro Europe, the, the ghost of religion and the ghost of Christianity. And he was like, f f you know, he saw it that, you know, there's a resurgence of, you know, these kind of Christian values. And you see it now popping up everywhere. And it's kind of, really, is that it? It's weird that, that we're having, you know, kind of, that we're going back to a Christian orthodoxy in a kind of way, you know? And I, I feel like, yeah, we did this, you know, may, maybe we should do something else. Yeah, well, the arrow moves both ways. I mean, Lehman was talking at the beginning about going back to the, to the, to the, the, um, the indigenous move as well. So I think there's the, you know, you go forward and you go back. If you just, if it's just a reactionary movement to the past, then it's always kind of lame, and you can feel it's lame, right? Whereas people like Gurdjieff might have been very grounded in the traditions, but they were radical at the, at the same time. Right, um, and I feel like the the great masters respond to the crisis of the time or whatever through their through through their own radicality, but also by connecting to the past, not just. I feel no, but like I'm not you talking about sorry, sorry, Ivan, but I'm yeah, I'm not talking about a reaction. I'm talking, you know, when we're talking about these deep seated paradigms, it's like a question. So, um, you know, what what kind of paradigm do you choose? You know, it's, it's like that. There's a reason that that paradigm played out as it was, and that we came to this point where we are, and and maybe and maybe that would be my argument. We should we should leave that ghost be, you know, and and try to tune in into the new kind of paradigms. That would be my my thinking, my feeling. I don't think we're going to have much choice in the matter when you look over longer spans of time, right? The kind of world that's emerging now is fundamentally different than the kind of world we had before. This stuff's going to be happening. It's a transhuman, planetary, symbiotic, human-machine intelligence network civilization that mm -hmm. is also moving off planets and can restructure its own DNA. That's radically different than anything that's come before. And there'll be opportunities in the transition to be able to either do a regressive move or to double back and try to pick up something you think you missed in order to go forward. Right. Nietzsche had this great phrase that when somebody goes backwards, you don't know if they're retreating or preparing to make a great leap. So you need to know more information mm -hmm. about it. Uh, nonetheless, I think things are going to change so much that we're all going to be in a fundamentally different mode of doing all of this. We want to take as much of the basic human wisdom architecture as we can with us, and we can be tolerant of people who want to try to do it in the costuming of the inherited traditions, but at some point that's going to be left behind us. And yeah, the costuming the meantime, is not deep, the Deep respect it. for people who want to try it with those styles. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. Sorry, I don't. I don't want to say yes, but you know the the issue, the problem, you know, culturally speaking, that I see that you know these kind of religious substructure that we participate in, you know, con you know, and within our consciousness, our psyche, but also culturally, that's two thousand years old, you know, and so you know, and and what we see in our culture is like as you know that at the at the slightest moment, you know, we regress to a kind of quasi-religious thinking. You know, Thomas Hummerick always talks about uh, the the scapegoat mechanism. You know what? You know that is like a daily occurrence. What you see in media when you know these kind of religious structures, you know, from different angles and sides culturally, like come back in action. And so, and so the question is: so, you know, sure, how how much can we participate in that? How much should we? And, and, you know, what, what would be our evolutionary task? You know, we can't, we, we have to part participate on these structures, but the question is in, in what way? That's really my question. Does it really make sense to go back to, you know, uh, um, you know, old, old, these old rituals that created our culture and society for the last 2000 years? Or should From we my point of view? Yeah. 2,000 years is, uh, is the blink of an eye, right? I have this, you know, 6,000, 8,000 years. That's nothing, right? This little thing we've been doing called civilization with writing in cities, that's very recent, right? That's newfangled. These are 
Islam and Buddhism and Christianity are barely traditional in my view. Most of what humanity has been doing in the realm of the sacred, it was doing for 100 right. or 200,000 mm -hmm. years. That's where we've been building it up. And that's what we need to draw upon in order to move into this new futurism that we're facing. So the sense of archaic futurism, which I think you see in Gurdjieff's character, trying to find his way back to the source of the fragments of the esoteric wisdom and integrate those in a way that position us at the leading edge of great changes in the world. That's, I think, the move that's necessary. But essentially, it's not a decision, right? It's not like we sit around and go, well, we've decided to return to mythic traditionalism or to deny mythic traditionalism. It doesn't really come up like that. It emerges out of your character. Some people come out of Gurdjieffian training and they think, I have got to return to my Eastern Orthodox roots or something like that. And they can do that. They can play a role in that form. They're, if they're called to, then there's a role there. But I think going forward, fewer and fewer of us will be called to those traditional roles, and more and more of us will be called to the role of a kind of neo-shamanic spreading of the capacity to generate new symbols, new rituals, and new traditions for a strangely new epoch. Yeah, the, the Vajrayana tradition, you know, which I work with, uh, is interesting from that point of view because there's this thing called the... the um, the tertons and the tertons discover teachings which are for the future so 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 the, so it doesn't necessarily rely on one text or 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 one set of, set of, set of dogmas it, it takes into account the fact there's a continuity uh, between the past uh, and the future and that there there'll be new teachings for the future so uh, so i think that's that's an interesting mode and and i wonder you know because you know the book beelzebub which i just finished my first reading of it fully the whole book you know i tried to read it several times and i actually managed to finish it and uh this for the first you're supposed to read it three times right um or more but i wondered if like what that book would look like if it was written now what that would be the wildest book. It would be such a strange, <laughs> and uh, you know that it's already the almost the strangest book I've ever read. But what would it look like if it was written now? What a strange book that would be. I wonder if somebody's yeah. going to write the next, you know, uh, next Beelzebub. Uh, maybe that's your it's job. It's an unanswerable maybe. question, <laughs> but I think. A deep study of Gurdjieff's approach to communication is necessary in order to think about any of those sorts of new uh, language-based legomanisms, legomanism being his word for, you know, a complex that transmits wisdom forward through time in an artistic manner. Mm. Um, it's it's absolutely essential like the minimum requirement for anything like that would be that a person has real growth real self insight real character and real depth of being to some significant degree but the second requirement would be do they understand human communication and how information is processed in a manner somehow similar to the way Gurdjieff is approaching it because he doesn't think you can just tell people he's obviously in favor of taking a big breath and creating massive complex sentences and inventing new words and straying between languages the way James Joyce does in Finnegan's Wake and of trying to set up structures embedded in the text that you don't encounter directly, but you kind of bump into them. And then when you bump into them again later, you start to map them out. And he's giving them strange terms, and he's codifying things at the edge of linguistic analysis. So there's this hugely rich understanding of the art of communication there that really isn't explored in many of the books about the work. So I included an appendix about that. But I think if somebody is going to take on that task for today or tomorrow, they would have to start really getting, a, getting to grips with how he thinks communication operates, especially wisdom communication. Yeah, he said, somebody said, I don't know if this is true, the book is written for the unconscious. It's not written for our conscious, conscious mind. So how do you read a book that's written for your, your unconscious mind? Do you read it like... The way you would read an ordinary book, uh, like just going through the words and trying to understand what they mean in some kind of literal sense, or what? What are you doing? What are you doing, what are you doing when you're reading What? 
But it, like, it's not only for the unconscious mind, but that's a huge part of it. And this is a guy who spent a long time, and he spells it out in the text, studying how hypnosis works, studying how the subconscious processes information, and trying to learn to communicate to that. So you can look for those little indicators. If you're familiar with processes of hypnotic induction, you'll find mm. things like that in the text. But basically, the approach is, as he says at the beginning, you've got to read multiple times, and you've got to read in multiple modalities, right? You don't get wisdom by reading. You get wisdom by rereading. You have to familiarize yourself in a deeply personal way, and you have to do it in different modes. So he says, try it once, and then try it as if you're saying it to someone else. And you actually should read it aloud, because that's a very different experience, and it brings different parts of yourself into it. And only after you've done that, then try to really see if you can see what the underlying structures are that he's hidden under the sea of the text. Yeah. Uh, but I would say another part of it in terms of getting to grips with subconscious communication is falling in love with the flavor or the character of the person. And I think the opening chapters of his works, particularly the arousing of thought in Beelzebub's Tales, that's a chance for you to get to know who this guy is, what his sense of humor is, what he's like as a being, and then you can travel with him through the story. And there's something person to person that reveals subconscious depths in a way that our normal waking analysis of words is never going to show to us. You know, I think Finnegan's Wake is a good good comparison to this. You know, poetry. Also, what what's the book called? Uh, Lever uh, 418 from from Crowley. That books make no sense on the rational level. You know, because it's just wild symbolic ramblings uh, that make sense if you it makes sense rationally if you know all the symbols. But if you if you engage with it, you know, from a, from a more holistic, unconscious realm, suddenly these these images speak to you and and transform that you in the way that you are able to engage. You know, let your let yourself um, be touched by those images. And I think that's the same well, modality that is. Hmm? There's one more thing here, which is pondering, right? Pondering is hugely important in Gurdjieff's approach. Uh, in C.S. Knott's Teachings of Gurdjieff, there's wonderful sections where Oraj really spells out what pondering is and what it's for in the teaching. But you're supposed to assimilate this stuff. You're not supposed to just read it and know right. about it. So how you do that, one way is you read through when you find something that moves you, something that makes you go, hmm, what, what's, what's with that? Stop. Don't just put more words into your brain after that. Sit with that. Ponder it. Weigh it out. Try to find what it connects to that's personal in your being. Right. Really undertake a deliberate, intentional effort of assimilation around the parts that you feel are pregnant with meaning. Because if it's designed to communicate to subconscious layers of our being, you won't immediately know what it is that you've recognized, but you might feel it. And if you feel it, stay with that feeling. Chew on it for a while. I think that's a really good instruction for that kind of communication no. yeah i also sense that the function of that text is also to break apart oh he says this i'm just basically repeating it just the automatic cliches the you know the 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 the, 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 the we're so subject to unthinking language right we're so so subject to all kinds of memes and all kinds of you know egregores of thought and and thought systems which we 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 th that are like parasites on our being right and and i think there's it's like mercury that is is dissolving those kind of parasitical thought forms that we are we are stuck with or we are you know we are burdened with living in the modern world especially so there's another reason why i think gurdjieff is very important now because we're so vulnerable to that possession of of uh you know unthinking thought forms absolutely in the way that it's structured but also in very overt critiques he makes about the way we socially communicate information 
Right? If you read uh, any of the introductions, but particularly the introduction to Meetings with Remarkable Men, it contains critiques of what he, you know, the Bon Ton literary language and journalism. These are the words he's using to describe it in 1920, but it applies equally well to the news and to social media and to the mimetic surface flood of the civilization that we all face now. And his insights into how that endangers us and which parts of us are endangered by it and how we sidestep that both as generators and recipients of communication is worth deep study. You know, well said. That's one hour on the point. <laughs> oh, it's My Jay's German side German, is very, very the German, happy now. <laughs> the German Nazi arrives knocking at your door. It's over, guys. The party's over. No, no, but you, you said it, and then the, the, the silence set in, and I was looking at the watch and the clock, and then it says exactly one hour, so that's great. Tom, nothing I was makes, just getting started. I was just, happy. I was just getting, I was just getting into it. I was just like, okay, we're we finally made it somewhere. <laughs> anyway, hmm. well, it's been well, great. It's I, been I, a delightful conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. I really want to read your book. Uh, I'm going to read it soon. Uh, and I loved the first three pages. They were so good. <laughs> but um, well, but, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, not quite as much as Gurdjieff's work, but hopefully what I've written um, requires rereading in order to pick up the nuances that I've embedded in there. And I've tried mm. to bring a lot of character play to it the way that he does, but also just to lay out the parts of his work that have been most personal and most generative for me, as well as, like I said, how this might fit into a leading edge cultural and intellectual movement today, coupled with a deep analysis of what the communication approaches might yeah. be. So, so your your the form of how you wrote it is also Gurdjieffian in a sense. Would you say? Huh? Yes, and there's a lot of playfulness, right? The we put together. This is the first book from Sky Meadow Press. So uh, Brendan and Jared and I put together this form and this cover to look a little bit like uh, a 1970s book that I might have found on a used bookstore shelf when I was a kid. <laughs> cool. uh, and then we have this weird play of breaking sections up into a French menu, which is just a little nod to the fact that most of his writing was done in Paris at restaurants and things like that. So there's li all, little details and fun in the structure, nice. as well as some underlying esoteric elements to it. Nice. Yeah, he he uh, he wrote it all in this cafe called the uh, um, Cafe Opera. I think I've been there. It's the noisiest, most annoying, you know, uh, most expensive and idiotic cafe in all of Paris. And I, I think he wrote it there. You know, on, it was probably like that in the twenties as well. Uh, it probably hasn't changed, and he probably wrote it just because it was such an obnoxious place. And <laughs> anyway.